Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Scott Sumner. Scott is my colleague in the Ralph G. Hotry Chair of Monetary Policy at the Mercatus Center. Scott joins us today to discuss his new book, The Money Illusion. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thanks for inviting me, David. Well, it's a big day for the show, and it's a real treat to have you here because your book is being launched. We're going to go to an event today here in town in D.C., but you have a new book out, and we're excited to promote it and talk about it. This book is the book of your journey, right, (laughs) really, since the Great Recession, and we'll get into that. But several other reasons this is a big deal, at least for me, is this is the first podcast we've done in person back in the studios at Mercatus Center, Scott. So you are a very you know, select crowd here. You're the first one back recording in studio, in person. And this will also be show number 300. So Great. this is the 300 show we will have issued or ran since we started back in 2016. So it's exciting to have you on. And I believe the last person we had in person, the last time I was in the studio, it was Paul Schmelzi. I don't know if you saw that episode. He has that paper showing the, the 700-year downward trajectory of interest rates. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, very interesting. I was just as curious. So back when we talked with him, the tenure was like at 1.6. So now it's at 1.3. So his theory still seems to be holding up for the most part. But we're here today to talk about you and your book. And you have a great book called The Money Illusion, Market Monetarism, The Great Recession, and the Future of Monetary Policy. And you have six sections in your book. I'll just mention them briefly. The value of money, the dance of the dollar, never reason from a price change, how to think about macroeconomics, the Great Recession, what does it all mean? So those are the big sections. But instead of going through those, I want to maybe talk to you from a perspective of your journey in writing this book. You know, How did this book come about, the stages of your experience from um, the Great Recession period right around then to the present? So Let's start with what you were working on right prior to the Great Recession. So you've been doing some research, I believe, in three different areas. So let me talk about those. Great. So, yeah, the book is sort of based on my blogging, but the blogging itself is based on research that I've been doing before the Great Recession began. And I kind of felt like once I got into it that my research gave me a unique vantage point because I was looking at three separate areas that all sort of came together in the Great Recession and gave me certain perspective that some other people maybe didn't have. Those three areas of research were work on the Great Depression of the 30s, which has obvious parallels to the Great Recession of 2008, the Japanese liquidity trap of the late 1990s, And also using market indicators as a guide to monetary policy. So I was very interested in ideas like creating a nominal GDP futures contract to guide monetary policy or market indicators more broadly. And then in late 2008, a bunch of things happened that seemed to me very closely related to the research I'd been doing. Like I saw a lot of parallels to what had led to the Great Depression. I saw market indicators flashing red and were seemingly ignored because of reliance on, you know, more of a sort of Taylor rule approach. Inflation was high during 2008. So I got very concerned about where policy was going around the fall of 2008. And I think it was partly based on the research that I've been doing. So you were early to the party of sorts of warning that this could turn out really bad. This looked like another Great Depression. I should mention your work on the Great Depression was cited by Gotti Orgidson, his great papers that he wrote on the Great Depression, the AER. So you had all these interesting papers and projects going on, and you said you saw signals in 2008. So what were specifically some of the signals that really had you worried? I guess there were several signals, but probably the two that were of greatest concern were the sharply falling stock market and the dramatically shrinking tip spreads. So the tip spreads, as you know, are a sort of a crude indicator of market inflation expectations, and they went negative in the fall of 2008. But there were many other indicators all over the global economy showing a sharp contraction hitting during that fall quarter. So particularly, I think, right after Lehman failed, and that was in September 2008, the Fed did not cut interest rates. That's when I became sort of radicalized. Over the previous two decades, I'd been pretty content with Fed policy, and I went 
For instance, I visited Harvard University. At that time, I was living in the Boston area. I spoke with one, say, New Keynesian economist and had a good conversation. But at one point, I asked something like, doesn't the Fed see what's going on? And he responded, oh, they see it. They just don't know what to do about it. And that really had a profound impact on me because I had read a number of papers by well-known economists, including Ben Bernanke, that were highly critical of what Japan had done, you know, what Japan had done in the 90s and early 2000s. And it offered suggestions as to what monetary policy should be doing that it insisted that the zero bound was not a barrier. Lars Fenson had the foolproof way out of liquidity trap and so on. And I thought those papers were very good. And I thought we had a roadmap for what to do if we got in the same situation as Japan. And then suddenly in the fall of 2008, discovering, no, we don't have a roadmap, that was very disillusioning for me. So I became kind of radicalized and I started blogging <laughs> and so on. It's hard to think of you being radicalized. You're such a nice person, Scott. But you were. You were definitely beating the drums that the Fed should be doing more. And they were slow to respond. And your work on the blog kind of kicked off at this time. But if I understand correctly... You were almost giving up on monetary policy research up until this point. You thought everything was kind of like settled or done. You still had interest in the futures, but you didn't see yourself doing this journey, going on this path, right? You're going into some other areas of research. Is that right? Yeah, I'd been doing some work on neoliberalism policy, sort of more development-oriented policy issues. Interestingly, I had just been working on an idea for a paper arguing that it's impossible to predict recessions, especially demand-side recessions, because if we could predict them, we could prevent them. James Hamilton said something similar to that at one point, I remember. And the basic idea is we shouldn't waste a lot of time trying to come up with models that would predict recessions, because if we actually had a model like that, the Fed would take steps to adjust monetary policy until a recession was no longer expected. And I gave up on that project because in the fall of 2008, I saw that policy was set at a position that was expected to lead to a recession, basically. We were not doing the things that would have been appropriate if we wanted to avoid a recession. We would have cut interest rates sharply after Lehman failed. So even if we knew a recession was coming, your point is we weren't doing what was necessary to respond. Even if we had that perfect foresight, we're still the problem of responding to yeah, it. Yeah. In one of my blog posts, I use this metaphor. I say, we shouldn't expect a highway engineer to forecast a bridge collapse. We should expect a highway engineer to prevent a bridge collapse. Like if they knew that bridge in Minneapolis was going to fall into the river a few years ago, they would have buttressed it before it fell, right? Right. right. So you don't really want to predict bridge collapse. You want to predict situations where you have to take a policy action to avoid a bridge collapse. And so you want a monetary policy that essentially is expected to avoid recessions. Now, recessions still may occur, but you don't want to be in a position where you're basically forecasting a recession because then you have monetary policy set at the wrong position with the important caveat that there might occasionally be a recession that monetary policy can't do anything about and is predictable. Now, would that occur ever? I doubt it. The COVID recession was certainly something that could not have been prevented by monetary right. policy, but that was also pretty much not predicted, right? So right. you'd have to have sort of a predictable supply shock that you couldn't do anything about with monetary policy. I don't know what that would look like. Yeah, that's a tough nut to crack. So a big part of your presence was your blog, which was also called The Money Illusion. And your book is kind of a compilation of your thoughts and ideas over this time. How did you get into blogging? You were frustrated, you were concerned, you felt policymakers weren't responding in a timely fashion. So is that what prompted you to start blogging? And why blog? Why choose the blogging medium? Oh, well, I wrote a few op-eds that didn't get published, and I'm not very good with computers, but someone helped me set up the blog. It was just a way to get my ideas out there. And when I started blogging, I didn't expect very many people at all to read the blog, and it did sort of catch on for a while, I think partly because it was a very topical issue and a lot of people were talking about it. I had a little bit of a fresh perspective, so... I had a perspective that didn't fit neatly into the standard narratives on either the left or the right. So I was arguing policy was, you know, too contractionary, which wasn't necessarily friendly to people on the right. And I was arguing that we should be using monetary stimulus. And a lot of people on the left thought only fiscal stimulus would work in that situation. So it was sort of a third way approach. And I think that carved out a little niche for myself. And of course, you're blogging at the time also. Yes. 
So you were called the blogger who saved the world. Remember that? I think it was 2012. That was it. The Atlantic had an article, the blogger who saved the world, because your work, the momentum it created, helped contribute at least to QE3, QE2. I forget exactly. What is your recollection of that story? Yeah, I think it was save the economy, which is itself a lot of hyperbole. <laughs> even hey, the world would be even more, Claim it. Yeah. more absurd. But obviously, it's flattering to get those stories. I don't think they're you know accurate, but I believe it was 2012. I think it was the Fed policy announcements. I may be incorrect on this. Late in the year, where there was some movements like QE3 and forward guidance. Do you remember there was going to be a fiscal cliff at the beginning of 2013? Yeah. So late 2012, the Fed announced a number of initiatives like QE3 and some pretty aggressive forward guidance. And it was partly done to offset the anticipated slowdown due to the fiscal austerity at the beginning of 2013. And I think there was a positive stock market reaction to the announcement and sort of a little bit of a euphoria in the financial yeah. press about this move. So there were a couple articles that mentioned my name in this period. But, you know, I think that realistically, people like Michael Woodford, you know, have more influence. So as I recall, Michael Woodford gave a talk at the conference in Wyoming, Jackson Hole, and mentioned nominal GDP targeting as sort of a good second best policy, good compromise policy, level targeting specifically. There was a number of people that were pushing the Fed more aggressively in the early 2010s. And so I don't think it was my blogging per se. Maybe I had a little well, bit of influence on the Well, it was an important piece of the debate. puzzle. How about that? There's a big puzzle that led the Fed to be more accommodative during that time. Christina Romer, who was at the CEA back then, she had a, I remember she had an op-ed in the New York Times said, will Bernanke have his Volcker moment? You know, and she called for the nominal GDP targeting. But you were definitely an important piece of that momentum, that push to, to respond. And I know also we've looked back and we've read Bernanke's book. You know, even if Bernanke wanted to follow everything you prescribed, it was very difficult internally with, you know, regional Fed presidents who disagreed, much more hawkish. You had Congress coming down on him. So there's a lot of moving parts there, but you are definitely one of them, right? You, I think you played an important role. Now, just briefly before we get into some of the substantive parts of your book, so you were blogging and you continue to blog. I should say that. It's pretty amazing. You continue to blog, continue to respond to comments on your blog. But at what point did you come to Mercatus? So you were working at Bentley University. So what year did you begin working as a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center? I think it was 2015. As I recall, I started maybe six months on a sort of temporary contract of some sort, then kind of went full time, maybe at the beginning of 2016, roughly. And at that time, I was just finishing up teaching at Bentley University. I'd been there for more than 30 years. So I sort of retired from teaching and went full time with Mercatus. But I was basically working out of my home for family reasons. We decided we wouldn't move. My daughter was in high school. and Sure. So you started blogging out of Bentley University 2008 or 2009? Beginning of 2009. Okay, beginning of 2009. But you were writing op-eds, you were visiting Harvard faculty, trying to ask them what, what's going on. You started this conversation really, I'd say late 2008, but blogging 2009. And then this added to your notoriety, your fame, if I can say that. And then Mercatus Center picked you up. Other people were interested in your work as well. And I just want to say, as someone who works with you as a colleague, I'm very grateful for all that because I wouldn't be here, Scott, if it weren't for you and your work. You're the reason we have a monetary policy program at the Mercatus Center. The reason we have this podcast right now is because you started this monetary policy program. And we've brought on you know, Chris Russo, another scholar, and we have several people working with us. So we appreciate all your labors, all that you've done. We continue to appreciate what you've done. And that includes your new book, The Money Illusion. So I want to uh, get- Let in me just interject. Sure. I appreciate- what you've done, I think you've raised the program to a higher level since you've been here. So certainly your podcast is one of the most important parts of our program, I think. Well, let's just say this. I still pinch myself that I get paid to talk to interesting people like you and others. So it's been a real treat for me too. But your book, The Money Illusion, again, it, it kind of encapsulates all that you've done, you've worked on over the past decade plus. I want to step back and tell your story, your interpretation of what happened in 2008. Really, I guess you could say 2006 to 2009, because you have a very different view than kind of the standard account of what happened in the Great Recession. Like some people prefer to call it the Great Financial Crisis. They see it as a financial crisis. Some see it as a housing crisis or a credit boom bust cycle. But you have a very different story to tell. Maybe not entirely different, but you definitely focus on something else that's more important. These are kind of like secondary effects. So maybe walk us through your interpretation of what happened during that time. 
Right. So most people have a vision of business cycles where policymakers such as the Fed and fiscal policy are like firemen that come in and put out fires. And in this vision, the private economy is inherently unstable. It creates problems. And we have to fix those problems with federal policies of various sorts. The monetarist perspective that I come from sees policymakers as more like arsonists. This is a little bit cruel, of course, and I don't mean this disrespectfully because they're doing the best they can. But policymakers unintentionally create fluctuations in nominal GDP growth. And when there are these fluctuations, if it's very high, you get an inflation problem. And if there's a sharp slowdown in nominal GDP growth, you get a severe recession and often a financial crisis. And these are predictable effects of a slowdown in nominal GDP growth for two reasons. One is nominal wages are sticky, and the other is people contract nominal debts. For that reason, when the flow of nominal income in the economy drops sharply, there's less money to pay workers and less money to service debts. So you get high unemployment and you get financial stress. And this occurs almost every time there's a sharp slowdown in nominal GDP. But because it's hard to see the connection between monetary policy and nominal GDP, people reverse the causation. And they see what's going on as instability in the private economy causing a recession and then policymakers coming in to fix the problem. So the indicators people use for monetary policy, like money growth and interest rates, are not really reliable indicators. And therefore, they don't really see how Fed policy could have actually caused the Great Recession by allowing nominal GDP growth to slow sharply. But that's, in fact, my view of what happened. And I think over time, that view has become strengthened by lots of other things that I've learned that I didn't even know when I started blogging. The work of Kevin Erdman on housing, you know, I learned that the whole idea of a housing bubble was probably a misconception. The housing prices were not unreasonable in 2006. The level of housing construction was not unreasonable in 2006. I think we know that now from some of this recent research. The slowdown in housing construction beginning of 06 and 08 was not associated with a sharp rise in unemployment. The recession was really caused by a broader drop in nominal GDP growth that affected all industries, not just housing construction. The banking crisis didn't really get severe until the fall of 2008. And that severe banking crisis took place about nine months after the recession started. So rather than causing the recession, it was itself a response to slowing nominal GDP growth. Another misconception is that the Fed was doing all it could in 2008. Not only was it not doing unconventional stimulus in 2008, it wasn't even doing all the conventional stimulus it was. It refused to cut interest rates after Lehman failed in September of 2008 holding them at 2%. So a lot of people, I think, sort of misremember the early stages of the Great Recession and have this sense that there was this wildly unstable speculative economy that collapsed and the Fed had to come in and clean up the mess. And that's just not what happened when you look closely at the data. So going back a few years before that, when the Fed had all those rate hikes from, I guess, mid-2004 up to 2006, do you think that was another example of them responding to bubble pressures, bubble talk? Why were they tightening back then? Because that surely contributed to this collapse. Actually, I think that those interest rate increases were appropriate okay. in my view. So I believe they should be targeting nominal GDP growth. Now, exactly where is debatable, but nominal GDP was growing pretty briskly in 2004, 5, early 6. So the equilibrium interest rate was probably rising during that period. And the Fed probably needed to raise interest rates to prevent inflation from overshooting at that time. I think that the real mistakes were made maybe from late 2007 all through 2008, but especially in the second half of 2008. Yeah. And this is the response I've gotten because I share your view. I've written op-eds. I wrote one in the New York Times. I mean, I got so much hate mail from that. <laughs> and the argument I made was with Ramesh Panuru, you remember this, is that the way we looked at it, and I think you share the same perspective, is the Fed cut rates to 2%, and everyone will say, man, the Fed cut rates from like 
what was it, 4 or 5% all the way down to two, it was massive rate cuts, and you're telling me the Fed hasn't done enough? The problem is, though, they stop in April, and they don't do anything until October, right? So that equilibrium rate is actually declining, 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 and they're keeping the policy rate fixed at two. So there's a growing gap between what the actual rate is and what the kind of equilibrium rate is. But moreover, the Fed was talking up rate hikes in the first half of 2008. So if you look at speeches, even the ever call the August FOMC minutes talk about how participants believe that they would have to raise or tighten policy because inflation was taking off. And in, in September, which is probably the most, you know, egregious example, <laughs> Lehman had collapsed. And they said in their statement, you know, there's equally concerned about output collapse and inflation taking off at that time. That's a long period from April to October to kind of sit on their hands in terms of monetary policy. Well, yeah, and I would even go further. I don't think those rate decreases mean what people think they mean. So when people think about the Fed cutting interest rates, they visualize an easy money policy, right? But rates can move around for many reasons. And because of the sharp slowdown in the housing market in 07, the natural interest rate was falling. Mm, good point. Now, the Fed was actually preventing market interest rates from falling as fast as they normally would have. They weren't pushing rates down. I'll give you an example. From about August 2007 to May 2008, a period of about nine months, the Fed didn't increase the monetary base at all. That's very unusual because normally the base creeps up a little every year during that period. And that sharp slowdown in the monetary base was done to prevent rates from falling even faster. So we have this sort of cognitive illusion. We see the Fed cut rates every few months, and we think, oh, they must be doing easy money. The rate's going down in stepwise fashion. But if the equilibrium rate is falling faster, that same Fed policy may be holding them up above the equilibrium rate. And there have been some studies that estimate where the equilibrium interest rate was, and they show the rate falling faster than the Fed cut rates. So I think it's very misleading to look at how the Fed is tweaking rates up or down and drawing any implications about the stance of monetary policy. Now, then later, they, of course, did increase the monetary base sharply You know, when we got into the QE programs. But by that time, it was sort of too late to prevent a severe recession. But I do think that if they'd been more aggressive with monetary policy in late 07 and into 2008, the recession would have been far milder. It's just hard to see that and to recognize that there's both the actual target rate and then the equilibrium rate. And you got to look at the gap between the two, if there is one. And that's the stance of policy, not what the absolute level of the rate is. And, you know, in a sense, it's sort of even worse than you'd think. It's not just that the interest rate is kind of unreliable or sometimes unreliable. As a general rule, when the Fed is cutting interest rates, monetary policy is getting tighter. And that's because when they're cutting them, it's usually a period when they need to be cutting them faster. It's when we're going into a recession. And as a general rule, when the Fed is raising interest rates, they're usually falling behind the curve. The equilibrium rate is rising faster, and they should be raising rates faster. So a lot of the business cycle historically in the U.S. has been the Fed moving rates around more slowly than the natural rate. And so it's almost exactly the opposite. I sometimes use the analogy of when wages are falling, they're usually above equilibrium right? Because yeah. wages are sticky, slow to adjust. And when wages are rising, they're usually lagging behind equilibrium. So it's sort of counterintuitive in that sense. But this is consistent with your call for a futures market. I mean, what you're saying is the Fed typically is behind when it's adjusting rates, whether up or down. The Fed is effectively following where the fundamentals are taking interest rates, and often it's too slow to do so. And what you, I think your argument for the markets, relying on market signals more, and in particular your futures contract, is that it would help the Fed get over that problem, right? The Fed would be much more nimble and responsive to the changes in the economy. Exactly. So if you want 5% nominal GDP growth, you want to set interest rates, not according to some formula like the Taylor rule, you want to set interest rates at a level that the market believes will lead to 5% nominal GDP growth over a, say, one or two year horizon. Yeah. Okay. So the nice thing is all of your research agendas kind of all come together and fit in a nice big picture here. Okay. So one other angle on this is the kind of financial crisis story. As I mentioned, some people call this the great financial crisis. You know, I like to call it the great recession. And the people who do that, they view this through the prism. It was a financial crisis. You know, the financial system was crashing. Shadow banking had a run on it. The institutional money markets had a run on them. 
And the Fed had to step in. In fact, the Fed opened up its first dollar swap line facilities. Actually, they've been around longer than that, but they opened them up to multiple central banks. So people focus on that side of the story. But you stress is that before that happens, there has to be a slowdown in nominal income growth that makes it harder to fulfill obligations and financial contracts. Is that right? I think that's usually the case. Obviously, it's possible to have a financial crisis during a period of stable nominal GDP growth, but historically. As far as I know, these sorts of financial crises tend to occur almost always when there's a sharp slowdown in nominal GDP.、Growth. I mean, the Great Depression would be another example, right? Great Depression, Argentina around 2000. There's many other examples like that. Of course, Europe. By the way, it's interesting that Europe had a recession the same time as we did, even though they didn't have the subprime situation.、Yeah. Well, they point to other debt problems like Greece, but. That's very predictable. When European nominal GDP growth plunged even more than it did in America, it's natural that the weakest borrowers are going to struggle in that kind of environment. And early on, there was almost a little bit of gloating in Europe about how you know America was being hit by our reckless cowboy capitalism in right, early 2008,、right. and they had been more responsible in their banking behavior. Well, at that time, almost no one expected that the European recession would be far worse than the United States. Well, let's say you take this hypothesis that it's the subprime mortgage that caused the American recession. Could you explain why the recession was worse in Europe based on that? Obviously not. But suppose you felt it was due to monetary policy and how it impacted nominal GDP growth. Now there is a big difference. The ECB raised interest rates in July of 2008, making their initial slump even steeper than the U.S. And unlike the Fed, the ECB raised rates twice in. Early 2011, immediately followed by a double dip recession in Europe, which we didn't have in the United States. So there's a direct correlation between monetary policy errors by the ECB and their deeper double dip recession, and the somewhat less bad response of the Federal Reserve and a milder recession here. On the other hand, if you take the subprime mortgage theory, there's no way to explain why Europe was hit much harder than the United States. And going back to 2008 as an example, I mean, if you look across country, you know, Australia also had a high amount of household debt, a lot of leverage there, a lot of high home prices. So all the same symptoms the U.S. had, but it had a very mild experience, right? It, it, I'm not even sure if it had an outright contraction; just it maybe slowed down a bit. But they had a much more accommodative monetary policy, right? So they had a higher trend rate of growth of nominal GDP. And for various reasons, their economy is a little bit faster growing, has more immigration, has a little higher inflation target than other Western countries. All those came together to produce about six and a half percent trend growth in nominal GDP in Australia at that time. And what that meant is that nominal interest rates in Australia were historically higher than in other Western countries. So one advantage Australia had is they didn't face a zero bound problem, and they maintained nominal GDP growth at a healthy enough level. It did slow during the global recession. Healthy enough level to avoid a, a technical recession. There was a slowdown in Australia, and they actually went from the early '90s and all the way up to COVID before they had a recession about 30 years, roughly. Yeah, that's amazing. No recession from 1990 up until 2020. I mean, that's just a, quite the run. So hats off to the Australians. Now, the other example I want to bring out that lends support to your thinking about you know, financial crisis is this past year, 2020, and we saw no banking crisis. We saw some stress in financial markets in late January and February. Stock markets were contracting quite a bit, but once the Fed stepped in, things looked much better. But one can make the argument the reason we didn't have a severe financial crisis last year is because of all the nominal income support from the government, both through monetary policy and fiscal policy. That nominal incomes were not only stabilized; they went above trend, and that meant people could make their mortgage payments, they could make their car payments. So, in nominal terms, at least, the financial obligations were met. The nominal debt constraint wasn't binding. Exactly. So both of us have been promoting this notion of level targeting for quite a while, and the idea is whether you're targeting prices or nominal GDP, when you have a slump, you want to come back to that trend line as quickly as possible. And as you recall, in the Great Recession, when we had the deep slump in both nominal GDP and in inflation, we simply set a new and lower trend line. We didn't come back to the original trend line, and that made the recovery very slow from the Great Recession. This time around, nominal GDP. Is already back close to the trend line. You can draw the line a little 
different ways, but we're basically back close to yeah. trend. In terms of the price level, we're actually slightly above the trend line because of you know these supply shortages. So in the nominal sense, nominal spending has recovered you know very strongly. And as a result, I think that's the major reason we haven't had a debt crisis. And we've had very aggressive both monetary and fiscal policy during this period. But I also think the expectations channel has been important. I think the markets have bought into the Fed's commitment to do average inflation targeting and make up for any inflation shortfalls. And that's boosted confidence. Also, the Fed's willingness to sort of do whatever it takes in buying a lot of assets to stabilize things has helped. And there's certainly been a lot of fiscal stimulus, which has helped average people service debts, as you say. So yes, I think that does explain why the financial crisis hasn't occurred this time. Yeah. And I want to stress that point about average inflation targeting being an important part of that story because it's the Fed saying, look, we're going to do no harm. We're going to allow the recovery to occur at a healthy pace, get back to the trend line, and we're not going to get in the way. Whereas in the past, they would try to nip the recovery before it even really took off because they were concerned about inflation forecasted looking forward. So I think the Fed is an important part of that, understanding that story. I stress this because I'll just bring up some recent things that have been happening. You know, Jay Powell is up for nomination again, as you know, and many progressives have been attacking him because he hasn't been really strong or he's at least dialed back financial regulation. They don't think he's been enough to stabilize the financial system. And, and you can have that argument, that conversation. But what that conversation is missing, in my view, is the fact that this new framework probably does even more for financial stability than tweaking financial regulations do, because it's a commitment to preserve the flow of nominal income into the economy. You do that, you get, for the most part, financial stability. Yeah, I think that's right. From my perspective, the Fed's role in monetary policy is by far its most important role. I do think there are some issues with financial regulation related to the moral hazard in our system from FDIC and so on. And I have an open mind on what the regulation should be. Maybe you could argue for a little bit higher capital requirements or things like that. That's not my area of expertise. But for monetary policy, I think Powell's done a, an excellent job with the new policy of average inflation targeting. And he's also very skilled at signaling and working with Congress and so on. So I've been pretty happy with his performance. So, Scott, we've been talking about your book and what you discuss in it. Now, the book was finished in 2018. Is that right, 2018? Mostly finished in around 2018. So it was written before the COVID recession, which is a little bit unfortunate. <laughs> right. But, uh, you do recognize it in the book, though. I've looked. You do. I do. I do mention it. So after it's written and goes to the publisher, you do have a chance to come in and add a couple paragraphs to reflect current events. So it does look to readers like it was written recently, and some of the data was updated. Yeah. But, you know, the core manuscript was written earlier. And I should mention that I think it was unfortunate because this is a book about how nominal shocks cause recessions. And we're hit right as the book is coming out with a once in a hundred year real shock recession. <laughs> so the timing is not exactly ideal. But on the other hand, I feel good about some of the other aspects of the book. Maybe we can talk about. Yeah, let's talk about some of the claims, the ideas you argue for in the book. And we've touched on this a little bit, but start with your critique of the traditional bubble story. Right. So I'm a believer in the efficient market hypothesis. Not that it's you know precisely true. No social science model is true. But I think it's a useful way of thinking about markets and how they aggregate information and provide optimal forecasts. So I think asset prices are usually relatively efficient based on fundamentals. And I'm very dubious of people who claim that such and such a market is obviously overvalued. Like most experts, I think, believe that the tech stocks in 2000 were obviously overvalued, or housing prices in 2006 were obviously overvalued. And for several years, those claims against the EMH looked pretty plausible, right? But today, the you know tech stock prices of 2000 don't seem very high. In fact, do you recall people saying things like, those stock prices only make sense if you think American internet firms will eventually dominate the global economy? Well, well they do. Well, they do now. <laughs> right, right. Or the 2006 housing prices would only make sense if you think interest rates will get lower and lower and NIMBY regulations will stop new construction. Well, both of those things have happened and we're now at a new normal of much higher housing prices in America. So I think these markets were picking up some long-term trends 
that really did change the traditional fundamental price earnings ratio or rent price ratio in housing. And I think people are too quick to dismiss things as bubbles that may have underlying fundamental causes. I think the recent run-up in asset prices has strengthened my argument that maybe those earlier prices Mm -hmm. were not, in fact, too high. In fact, if you look around the world, that's the similar story. Yeah, all over the world now, housing prices are higher, and there's a growing acceptance that real interest rates will remain really low. You mentioned that 700-year study and so on. You know, in that environment, a flow of rents or dividends is just valued higher than it would have been in the 20th century. Okay. So that's the first idea that's been vindicated, your view of the bubble story. The other thing, though, is the Fed seems to be doing what you called for, some version of level targeting. You feel good about that, too? Yeah. I think there's actually two areas that I would cite where Fed policy has moved in a direction I feel more comfortable with. One is the average inflation targeting is pretty close to level targeting. That is, it's pretty much the idea that when there's an inflation shortfall below their 2% target, they allow a overshoot for a period of time until they get back up to the previous trend line. And that's what they've been trying to do. And I think they've done that pretty successfully during this COVID recession. Now, just as an aside, because it is such an unusual recession, I don't want to claim victory. Like it may be that just this recession is so much driven by the virus that we're overestimating what Fed policy has done, but at least it looks successful as best we can see so well, far. Let me ask a question on that particular point. Do you think it was unfortunate or was it fortunate that the Fed implemented this new framework during this time? You could say it's unfortunate because all these supply shocks kind of cloud the inflation interpretation, right? Maybe we shouldn't be looking at inflation the way we should, otherwise would if it were demand-driven. The fortunate part might be they came in with a big tailwind from fiscal stimulus. They were in a good position to try to hit their 2% target. There's both, I guess, two views to that. Yeah, it's, it's really hard for me to say. I think that a regular recession would have been a cleaner test. And actually, the test really would have been if we could have moderated the business cycle. So my view, which is a little bit out of the mainstream, is that during normal times, at least, monetary policy alone can stabilize the business cycle. So if we do end GDP targeting and level targeting, or even average inflation targeting, we'll have fewer recessions and milder recessions even without fiscal stimulus. But of course, in the COVID period, the shock was so large that it was inevitable we'd get a lot of fiscal stimulus. So it's a little hard to disentangle how much was done with monetary policy and how much related to the fiscal. So it wasn't really a clean test of monetary policy, in my view. I think the better test will be going forward when there's more ordinary shocks, how this policy works in, in that environment. So that's one area where policy is definitely moving in what I think is a good direction. I think I'm associated with nominal GDP targeting, but in a sense, I'm more committed to level targeting than I am to end GDP. The level part of it is, to me, the most important part. And then another part of what's called market monetarism is using market indicators as a guidepost rather than sort of a computer model of the economy where you plug in historical data on unemployment and output gaps and set policy on that basis. And I think we had a pretty clean test of the two head-to-head in early 2019. A year before COVID, the economy was slowing due to the China trade war and other factors, and there was nervousness in the markets, some pretty big drops in the stock market, and other markets were showing indications of a slowdown. I think the yield curve inverted briefly during early 2019. And I think during normal times, we would have had a recession in 2019. The Fed is traditionally behind the curve in reacting to this kind of situation where the equilibrium interest rate is falling. It's hard to observe. We don't observe it directly, but we can infer the equilibrium rate is falling because essentially the bond market is you know, signaling likely decline in interest rates in the future and so on. Well, what the Fed did this time is ignore the fact that the economy was booming, that unemployment was only 3.5%. They ignored their computer models and they looked at these market indicators And they cut interest rates three times in 2019. And that was something people didn't expect at the beginning of the year based on the strength of the economy. And lo and behold, by early 2020, the economy was continuing to do well, but it was not overheating. We were not seeing indications of high inflation. And so we dodged a recession that I think would have occurred. In fact, by early 2020, we were already in the longest expansion, more than 10 years. 
So I think that's a beautiful example of something that isn't very noticeable because it was like the dog that didn't bark in the detective right, story, right? You don't right. notice it. <laughs> People don't notice there was no recession in 2019, but I think that's because the Fed took steps to prevent what would have normally occurred with a, a more backward-looking monetary policy that just looked at inflation and unemployment historical data. There was no need for a rate cut if you just looked at historical data at that time. It was all based on this forward-looking market data, as far as I can see, at least. Yeah, that's a remarkable period for several reasons. One is that the Fed turned around so quickly because 2018, they were talking about doing even more rate hikes. They had right. nine rate hikes between 2015 and 2019, and now they were talking about doing more. And in fact, you mentioned the yield curve. I remember John Williams, Lael Brainerd talking about, well, what's the big deal with a little inversion of the yield curve, <laughs> you know? So I actually made a T-shirt during this time that said, we have the nerve to invert the curve, <laughs> you know? I remember that. Yeah. So going from that, sometimes it's hard to change your mind when you say you're going to do something, but the Fed was nimble. And I give some credit to Powell helping navigate the Fed away from that potentially disastrous situation. And you attribute it to them taking market signals more seriously or observing what's going on. So let me take a more traditional view here and what someone might say who wants to stick with the computer models, the kind of the new Keynesian framework. They'd say, look, you're right. If we looked at headline numbers, we would have caused a recession. But the problem was, wasn't the model, it was our inputs. Like we misestimated what U star, the natural rate of unemployment was. We misestimated what R star was. And only after the fact that we realized it was much lower. So if we had those numbers right, now, what would be your reply to that if they said that to you? My reply is that's what the market indicators are implicitly doing. They're right. estimating those. Like in a perfect world where you had an NGDP futures market or something like that, if you're targeting the NGDP futures price at 4 or 5% growth, then whatever interest rate comes out of that policy is the natural interest rate, right? At least you'd hope it is. So we don't have any direct way to measure the equilibrium or natural interest rate in real time. And all we can do is guess what it is by looking at indicators. And my argument is that the market indicators are more timely in estimating movements and that the natural rate of interest can move very quickly in a crisis. Like if it starts to get worse and the Fed is behind the curve in responding, the mere fact that the Fed is behind the curve creates expectations of a downturn, which further depresses the natural rate of interest. So it's almost impossible in my view to do monetary policy without looking at market indicators at all. And in fact, the Fed has always paid some attention to them, right? They've, throughout history, the 1987 stock market crash, even the 1929 stock market crash, the Fed cut interest rates right after the crash. So it's never that they've ignored market indicators. It's more that they haven't paid sufficient attention to them until more recently. And I think 2019 was, for me, the most beautiful example of them paying just the right amount of attention. And I think without COVID, they would have engineered maybe the first soft landing, which I define as a period of time when unemployment stops falling for multiple years, but you don't go into recession. Now, you think that would be no great achievement, right? Unemployment falls as you recover, then it should level off at a low level, and you should go a few years without recession. But if you look at the unemployment time series, we never see that. that. Never it happens. goes down, 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 and then there's a recession. Yeah. Other countries, interestingly, do have soft landings, so it's not impossible. Britain had a soft landing in the early 2000s, so unemployment in Britain went down in the 90s, just like America, but they didn't have a recession in 2001. It just unemployment leveled off at a low level in Britain from 01 to 07 or whatever, somewhere around there. And so Australia's had soft landings. It can be done, but the fact that we don't indicates there's some fundamental problem with monetary policy that when we get to the peak of the business cycle, the Fed almost always mishandles things. They're behind the curve when sentiment turns negative and they cut rates too slowly and we never seem to get these soft landings. So that's sort of, to me, the holy grail of you know successful no, monetary policy. This is great. And Jay Powell may be seen as someone who ushers in this era on a more sustained basis where we do look more forward at, at asset prices, market signals. Going back to your answer to my question, you know, what a standard New Keynesian say to your critique, we need better measures of the output gap. But the problem is you can't. You can't get real-time measures of these variables. And the best thing you can do is look at market signals, right? I mean, there's you know, papers done how part of the 1970s problem was 
mismeasuring the output gap. Or Finides has this paper that says, look, if you take a Taylor rule and you apply it to the 1970s Fed and you plug in the real-time output gap estimates, they were doing things just fine. And so you're always going to have this problem. It's always going to be backward looking. It's always going to be, you know, unobserved. But what you do have are market signals. And so embrace them, use them. And I hope that the Fed can stick with average inflation targeting with the use of market signals. It's not been easy, though, Scott. You've seen the critiques that Powell has received from very prominent people like Larry Summers and many other inflation hawks. It just This is so different, right? This is so strange, so different. Some might even call it the Powell putt instead of the Greenspan putt. You know, they would actually see you know, the Fed relying too much on market signals and being too easy on inflation. But you're painting a much more optimistic picture here of what the Fed's doing. Yeah. Well, a couple points on that. One is that it's possible the Fed is being too expansionary. But getting back to the output gap, I want to make one other point on that. The fact is that we are now in a situation where it's probably more difficult than ever in my entire life to know what the output gap is. There's so many strange things going on with the supply side of the economy that I think it's very, very dangerous to rely on traditional models or rules of thumb when a lot of things are changing under COVID. So we need some kind of forecast target that we can rely on in a way that we can't rely on traditional indicators like the unemployment rate or employment population ratio or all these kind of indicators. So on critiques of monetary policy like that of Larry Summers, Summers might be correct that there's too much stimulus. To me, it's hard to say. I'm reasonably content personally with Fed policy. From my perspective, the markets are signaling fairly low inflation going forward. But it's really hard to say because during the 1960s, obviously, when we went into the high inflation period, you can find parallels where the initial increases were viewed as temporary and it'll get back to normal soon. And then it really didn't didn't. get back to normal, (laughs) right? So I think ultimately what you have to look at is do the markets continue to have faith in Federal Reserve policy? Does the Fed continue to have credibility on its long-run 2% average inflation target? That's really the key thing that we have to watch. And if it comes to the point where they start to lose credibility, then clearly the Fed has done too much stimulus. For now, it does seem like markets still expect inflation to go back to close to 2% in the not-too-distant future. But certainly the inflation numbers have been a little higher this year, quite a bit higher than a lot of people expected. It's a little hard to tell how much of that is temporary supply imbalances like used cars and things, and whether some of that is just a little bit too much demand. Because COVID has just messed up so many traditional indicators, done so many strange things to the labor market, to the supply of parts and other aspects of the macroeconomy. So I'm very skeptical of any pronouncements based on real economic data as a guide to monetary policy. Yeah. All future studies will have to put some dummy variables in for this period. Exactly. (laughs) Looking at time series or panel data, they have to be very careful with what is happening. Okay. So those are things we've touched on your bubble story. The Fed moving towards level targeting, the Fed relying more on asset price signals and traditional theoretical models to guide policy. And one other thing that comes out in your book is that the Fed should think carefully about aggregate demand shocks, but when it arises, aggregate supply shocks as well. And that seems to have come to fruition this past year too. Right. So one point I make in the book is I think I have a phrase like, I'm not a supply sider or a demand sider. I'm a supply and demand sider. So I think both sides of the aggregate supply and demand model are important. And both during the Great Depression and the Great Recession, I believe the initial contraction was caused by a negative demand shock. And in both cases, I think the recovery was slowed a little bit by some unfortunate supply side problems, more in the 30s than in the Great Recession. But I think we're seeing with COVID a perfect example of the importance of both the supply and the demand side because clearly there was a big drop in nominal spending in 2020 with COVID, but also we're seeing some real supply problems, especially in the recovery. So I don't think it's possible to look at this picture just from a demand side framework. That is, anyone who's looking at the picture and saying, well, unemployment is 5.2% and it should be 3.5% and therefore we need more monetary stimulus, 
I think is missing part of the picture. There are some changes in the labor market that are making it more difficult for firms to hire workers. And I think that we have to be cognizant that the economy is being buffeted both on the supply and the demand side. And that makes things a little more difficult. So although I'm a believer in nominal GDP targeting, I think during COVID, the appropriate policy would have been to aim for nominal GDP to be back on track out in the future, a year or two in the future, not like month by month. Like they shouldn't have tried to prop up nominal GDP in April of 2020 because that's just not reasonable policy with 14% unemployment, right? You couldn't print money to get those people back to work if they're sent home because of COVID. And if you tried to maintain nominal GDP growth, when real output drops that sharply, you would have had really high inflation and it still wouldn't have created jobs. So the reason why nominal GDP targeting makes sense normally is because normally when there's a big rise in unemployment, it's because people aren't spending enough, so there's not enough nominal revenue to get the workers reemployed. But if the workers are being unemployed because of health risks, nominal spending doesn't solve that. So I think the Fed appropriately let nominal GDP fall sharply for a few months and then aim to get it back on target in a reasonable period of time. And it looks like now in the second half of 2021, we are seeing nominal GDP returning to that previous trend line appropriately. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Scott Sumner. Check out his new book, The Money Illusion. Scott, thanks for coming on the show again. Thanks for inviting me, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>